All right. Imagine this. You just got paged in the middle of the night for a service you didn't build, so you're not entirely sure how to diagnose the problem, let alone fix it. So you start adding people from your team to a conference line, but of course, they don't know how to fix it either. They didn't build it either. So you start fishing for people from other teams, slowly getting more frustrated and resentful. And then it's total chaos. You have 20 people on a conference line. People are talking over each other. People are doing contradictory actions. It's impossible to know who's doing what and what's actually having an effect. Everyone's exhausted and confused. Panic sets in and people start yelling at each other. Hours go by and you still don't have a solution. Finally, the CEO gets word of the outage, dials in and demands why it isn't fixed yet. Does any of that sound familiar? I think a lot of us have an on-call nightmare like that. Sorry if I just triggered some PTSD for you guys. When you have an outage like that, every minute counts. Downtime can mean losing customers, which affects your bottom line. So it's important to have an organized approach to come to the fastest resolution, minimizing your recovery time and the cost of the outage. Before we go any further, I wanna get through some definitions. So a major incident is an unplanned service outage that actively affects your customer's ability to use your product. Now some more operationally mature companies may have a formalized incident response process. This is basically a runbook for how to behave during a major incident. It defines who needs to be involved, the steps you should take, how decisions are made, all that stuff. Now many incident response processes will have a role called the incident commander. They lead the response. They're the key decision maker, they delegate all tasks, and they keep communication flowing. Now, this is often abbreviated as IC. I know that's confusing because that can also stand for individual contributor. So if during this talk I say IC, know that I'm talking about the incident commander, but I'll try not to use abbreviations. So whether or not you have a formalized incident response process, it's pretty common to think the person best suited to lead during a major incident would be senior technical leadership. They have the subject matter expertise, they have the authority to make decisions, the problem is, that's not scalable. If a small group of technical leaders have to respond to every major incident, they're going to burn out. I'm here to tell you that you can streamline your incident response process by inviting non-technical people to serve as incident commanders. And I'm proof that this can be done without compromising response effectiveness. So who am I? I'm a bit of a business cat. My background is in project and product management. I joined PagerDuty as a scrum master and I'm currently working on their business intelligent team. And I am the first non-technical incident commander on our rotation. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about the top skills that really make a good incident commander and then I'm gonna walk you through how to train them in a nice friendly way. So, Skills that make a good incident commander. My goal here is to give you some top skills so you can identify people in your organization to serve as an incident commander and relieve that on-call load from your more senior technical leaders so they don't have to serve as an incident commander. Bit of a spoiler, none of the skills I'm gonna talk about today are technical skills. They're all soft skills. So although I am arguing that you do not need to be an uh, engineer to be an incident commander, I will say you should have a high level understanding of your system architecture. It's really helpful to just have a basic understanding of what your services do and how they affect the product and your end users. For me, this was just a matter of staring at our system diagram for a really long time. I actually made flashcards to try to memorize the silly names of our services and the silly names of our teams that own each of those services and what they do from an end user perspective. Just a basic understanding. The key distinction here is the incident commander does not have to understand the entire tech stack. They don't know, have, know, have to, how, know how to build or fix any of these things, just that basic high level understanding. Okay, so top skill for a good incident commander. You want somebody who has a mind for process. 
someone who is really good at remembering, following, and enforcing the structured steps in your incident response process. They have to be able to remember all the different formalized roles involved, who should be doing what, all the different communication rules, how information should be flowing, how decisions are made. This is a core competency of project managers, which is my background, so this was a really natural fit for me. <laughs> but you can think about other people who aren't necessarily project managers, but really thrive in that highly structured environment. They could do really well leading an incident response process. Next important skill is communication, but it's a specific kind of communication. You want someone who is comfortable with directive communication. They can't be afraid to tell people what to do, no matter what their day-to-day -day rank is. So an incident commander becomes the highest ranking per person on the call, higher than the CEO. Now obviously you need to get leadership approval for that definition of the role in advance, but even when you have that buy-in, you need someone who is gonna be comfortable maybe kicking off their manager if they're not being helpful on the call. You also want the incident commander to be good at a specific kind of facilitation that expedites the sharing of information and prevents the responders from debating too long what we should do. So for me, it's a matter of asking for proposals and then with that information, I will make a decision and always make sure we're moving forwards. Another key communication pattern is being specific about who you want to do what. So I won't say, hey, can somebody check these logs? No one will do it. I have to say, Matt, will you please look at this service? I'll get back to you in five minutes. And then Matt will go do that. Now this kind of directive communication style is actually my natural communication style which is not always the best when you're working with teams, especially as a scrum master, which is much more open and facilitative. So serving as an incident commander was actually a really good outlet for me to use this very specific communication style, which is really comfortable for me. So think about people in your organization who tend towards that side of the spectrum. Uh, maybe managers or product owners tend to take this stance. They may have these really good communication skills for an incident commander. Next important skill is time boxing. So you may have noticed in my example of the communication pattern of assigning a specific task, I gave Matt a time box. I told him to come back with me in five minutes with his results. So you need the incident commander to remember to always give a time box and to keep track of that time box and actually follow up within that time box. So at PagerDuty, we use this really high-tech system of uh, paper and pen of just jotting down, I told this person to do this at this time, five minutes, and I just keep that running log and look back at my notes to say, okay, that time has passed, I'm watching the clock. Matt, what do you have for me? Do you need more time? How much time do you need? Take a note of that, come back to him in that time. Another key responsibility of the incident commander is keeping information flowing and maintaining a regular cadence of updates for your customers and your stakeholders. So you need somebody who's gonna watch the clock and be, okay, it's, it's been 30 minutes, do we need to tweet out another update for our customers? So this is another core competency of project managers, keeping track of time, but you can think of other people on your teams that are really timely, always thinking about, you know, when's the next deadline, showing up on time, et cetera, who just, really good at watching the clock, could be really helpful for an incident commander. Now I just walked you through a few skills that are very structured and directive, and all of that needs to be balanced by really strong active listening skills. So you want an incident commander, especially when you're talking about a non-technical incident commander, to be able to listen to the expert feedback of the responders and use that information to make their decisions. So they're not just a tyrant saying, this is what I think we should do, go do it now. You're gonna listen to the experts who are the engineers responding to the incident, ask for those proposals, ask for the impact of those proposals, and based on that information, then I will make a decision and keep us moving forwards. And you don't want someone who's gonna just blindly follow the process. I made the, this decision, we're gonna keep going because this is the process and I'm enforcing it. 
You want somebody who's gonna be flexible enough to modify your plans as you get more information, as you run those tests and you get new information from your responders. And finally, even when you have a highly structured incident response process that you're all really good at, it's always gonna be a fairly chaotic situation. There's gonna be a lot going on. So you need someone who's an incident commander that can keep track and hear everything that's going on and follow along because it's, it's gonna be an intense situation. So here's a good summary of the top skills for an incident commander. They're all soft skills. You don't have to be an engineer to have these skills and be a really great incident commander. You could be more junior, maybe a more junior engineer who has some of these skills. You can have them be an incident commander. I talked a lot about project management because that's a bit of my background. Product managers have a lot of these skills. Um, we've got one or two product managers on our rotation now. And people managers, all of our engineering managers are incident commanders now, even though they're not writing code day to day. QA engineers may be a, a fit that you hadn't thought of before that are really good at time management, structured process, that type of stuff. So once you've identified some people who have those soft skills and you think could make a really good incident commander, how do you train them? It's still a really high stress situation. It's critical. They're leading a response when every minute counts, money's on the line. So you need a really good training process to get them up to speed quickly. And especially when you're talking about non-engineers being an incident commander, it can be super intimidating. I think even for engineers who've been on plenty of incident calls, this isn't a situation you wanna be in every week. It's not fun for anybody. Being outside of engineering, it's even more of a black box. It's really easy to think, oh, I could never understand what you're even doing. How could I lead or help in that situation? So you've got this really big hurdle to overcome to get these people to feel comfortable and confident to lead during this business critical time. So I'm gonna walk you through the training process that I went through at PagerDuty. And I wanna say throughout that process, I felt constant support and encouragement. I felt welcomed, like I was a part of the community. And that is so important to help people get over that imposter syndrome, especially for folks outside of engineering. So keep that in mind. So first, you need to start by specifically defining the incident commander role. Now we refine this over time at PagerDuty, but the key distinction here is the incident commander is not responsible for finding a solution. They should not be doing any investigation or mitigation tasks themselves. They're responsible for coordinating the response. They keep communication flowing and they delegate all tasks. Delegate means they're not doing it themselves. They're telling other people to go do the thing. It's enough cognitive load for any one person to be investigating, trying to find a solution. To add on that coordination and communication piece is too much for any one person. So this division of labor is really important. And by separating out, separating out the coordination role, that frees up your subject matter experts to focus on finding that solution. They don't have to worry about updating stakeholders or customers. The incident commander will take care of that. And this specific definition really frees it up for non-technical people to help out in this situation. So really good best practice that we do is we host regular incident response office hours. I think we're at twice a month right now. And we try to get people from all over the organization to come. It's on our company shared calendar. And we try to argue that a major outage, an incident response, it's not an engineering problem. It affects the entire business. Obviously, customer support needs to be familiar with what happens because they're gonna get customer complaints and gonna be able to, to speak to what's going on. Marketing may wanna change their communication if you have an active incident going on. Sales should be familiar with your incident response process. They're working with customers as well. And if you have a really strong process, if you can talk about the resiliency of your product, that's an asset for sales to talk about. So it's useful for the entire business to understand what happens during an outage. So we try to make that clear, have an open door policy, let people come and ask questions, walk through the documentation with them. And this is your opportunity to clarify the incident response role, that you don't have to be technical to do it, and really explain the need for more help. The more people you have on that rotation, the lighter the on-call load for everyone. 
And it's also a really good opportunity to get some visibility in the business. So once you've hooked a prospective incident commander that understands the need and expectations for their help, you put them on a schedule to shadow the incident commanders. So especially for a non-engineer, they've probably never been on call before. So this is a great opportunity for them to build up some empathy, feel that on-call pain a little bit, and really hammer in, huh, this is hard, and if we get more people on the rotation, it's easier for everybody. But you wanna make clear that when they get paged, so does the incident commander, they should dial in to the call. It's not enough to like look at the notes afterwards. They should dial in and listen in real time, but they have to remain silent. It's a high stress situation, every minute counts. You don't wanna distract from the response process by asking questions, so they have to stay quiet and just silently observe. Now that's a bit harsh, especially for a trainee. So after you resolve the incident, follow up with the shadow to see if they had any questions about, they were, about what they heard on the call. Make sure they feel supported in their learning. Now, scribe is another formalized role in an incident response process. They're responsible for keeping a real-time log of everything that happens during the incident. The major information that was shared, uh, the decisions that were made, the results of experiments, et cetera. Uh, we just do this in Slack, just type in the way, and this is really useful to analyze in the post-mortem. So this is actually a really helpful but low risk way for a trainee to start contributing to an incident. This is actually the first way that I got involved with a real incident. Uh, it was a longer running one, so the person who was scribing pinged me uh, in the background saying he really needed a bio break, could I take over? And I was a little nervous, but it was just typing. It's not the end of the world if you miss something. So I took over. It was a little stressful, but I just kept up as best as I could. And when it was over, that was the first time that I really felt like, I can help in this situation. I can actively contribute during a major incident. This isn't so bad. And keeping that real-time log really hammers in the process. Because I'm keeping track of it, it helped me learn and remember all those communication patterns. Next, you might have a trainee practice being an incident commander during a failure Friday exercise. So you may be familiar with Netflix Chaos Monkey. Now this is a process of intentionally injecting failure into your systems to see what happens and test the resiliency of your services. This is also a really great way to test your incident response process. So a lot of planning goes into this every week. We decide which service we're gonna take down. We do it during business hours. We're all in the same room. So it's lower risk and we'll ask our trainees who wants to volunteer to serve as the incident commander during this exercise. And they'll have tons of support. So it's another low risk way to get some really good hands-on experience being an incident commander to really build up that confidence and some credibility because the Failure Friday exer exercise will involve engineers. So you have this non-engineer being an incident commander in front of them, they'll gain some credibility. Next, you wanna have your trainee, after they've listened in to a few incident response calls, maybe helped out as a scribe or practiced during a Failure Friday exercise, set them up to reverse shadow. So make sure they have a buddy, an incident commander that is more experienced. And when there's an incident, they will both get paged, they will both join the call, but the trainee serves as the incident commander. So I'll get on the call and I'll say, hi, I'm Rachel, I'm the incident commander, tell me the situation. But I'll have Matt in the background sending me direct messages about, hey, remember to ask for the customer impact, or hey, it's been, it's been 10 minutes, you need to follow up with this person. It's really important to offer that support in the background so you're not undermining the authority of the trainee. You wanna let them lead, let them get this experience, and again, gain that credibility with the engineers. But it's so helpful to have a buddy that you can bounce ideas after off of. My first time being an incident commander, I was super grateful to have somebody to just message in the background saying, hey, is this, I think this is what's happening. Is that what they're looking into? Or um, is the status correct? I'm about to send an update. And he'd just say, yeah, you've got this. Keep going. You're good. It really helped me feel supported, like I can really do this. And I really did it. It felt great. 
after you resolve an incident, it's a huge sense of accomplishment. To resolve something so mission critical as a team, it's a great feeling. Then you celebrate. Your trainee has successfully led an incident response. They have graduated into a full incident commander. They're having a direct impact on the health of your service and the happiness of your customers. And having an additional IC on the rotation means less on-call load for everyone, which means better outcomes, less burnout. So here's an overview again of that training process. You need to start by defining the role. Remember, they don't resolve the incident, they coordinate. You can welcome non-technical people by explaining the process in some office hours then invite them to shadow silently, maybe have them help as a scribe, keeping that real-time log, and then practice during a Failure Friday exercise, serving as the incident commander, and finally reverse shadow with some help in the background. Now DevOps is all about building empathy and breaking down those functional silos between developers and operations for ultimately better business outcomes. Now, I believe we should expand this collaborative mission beyond just development and operations, but across the entire business, because technical and non-technical people can help each other when it really matters. If you want to learn more about how we do incident response at PagerDuty, we've actually open sourced our documentation. You can just go to response.pagerduty.com to read through all the different roles, uh, details about our specific process. And come find me later if you want to talk about incident response or how to welcome non-technical people into the DevOps community. Thank you all. Do we have time for questions? All right. Any questions from the audience? All the way in the back. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I was wondering if the incident commander role is a full-time job or a part-time? It's not a full-time role. So this is in addition to your, your major duties. Okay. So what, what, what does an incident what, what do you do, actually, uh, beside from incident commander? Uh, so I work on a business intelligence team. I'm basically a product owner for internal business reporting. We have engineering managers, we have product managers, we have engineers on our rotation, and they're responsible for those duties as well as going on call for incident command. So, so the incident commander can actually be rotated? Yes, that's the idea, yeah. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? We have that. Oh, okay. you're up next. Thank you. Recommended number uh, in a team of 20 people, the minimum recommended number? Well, for us, I believe we have 10 to 20 people on incident command so that we can limit the length of the shifts as much as possible. So I go on call, it's a two day rotation, two or three times a month. And the more people we have, the shorter it'll be. Our goal is to have two days once a month. Uh, okay, thank you. Can you so many questions? throw it over here to Mandy? Oh, I over there. My question got it. Yeah? Okay. Perfect. Oh. oh. Good thing it's from. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask that uh, you told us that uh, this incident commander can be, can be uh, someone, not a senior guy, yeah. but literally anyone. But mm -hmm. uh, how often does it work? Because, you know, for the guy who used to listen to the senior one day, has to change their role and everyone else should uh, listen to him. Uh, wouldn't uh, he get shy, you know, or uncertain in his solutions from your experience? So the incident commander shouldn't be coming up with solutions. You want someone who's able to get that information from the sen more senior technical people, but is still going to be confident enough to make a decision based on that information. And you do need buy-in from the organization and all the leadership that the incident commander, even if they're a more junior person, when they make a call based on the information they have, that's what we're going for. And it's better to make some decision and try something than to just waffle for endless time. 
Does that help? So, so from your experience, it uh, like it doesn't uh, lead to any problems from the junior person to become uh, the, the one who decides? Not at all. If you're searching for people with those good soft skills, you've defined the role and you have buy-in from leadership, it totally works for us. Cool, thanks. Great. Any more questions? No? Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.